Welcome back. I'm Max Bergman, director of the Stuart Center and Europe-Russia Eurasia program at CSIS. And I'm Maria Snigovaya, senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia. And you're listening to Russian Roulette, a podcast discussing all things Russia and Eurasia from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Russian Roulette. Today, we have a very special guest, Nicholas Veron. Nicola is a senior fellow at Bruegel and at the Peterson Institute for International Economics here in D.C., and we are going to talk about frozen Russian assets, and he is a fantastic guest to talk about that because he is one of the foremost experts about financial systems, financial reform around the world, including global financial regulatory initiatives and current developments in the European Union. In December of 2023, Nicola published a piece for Bruegel titled, quote, the European Union should do better than confiscate Russia's reserve money. You can find the link to the piece in the episode show notes. Today, we will speak with Nikola about his argument when it comes to frozen Russian assets, which is to not seize them, but maybe to seize the profits. Nikola, in your piece on frozen Russian bank reserves for Bruegel, you ultimately recommended against confiscating those assets in contrast to a number of other co- commentators, including uh, the FT's Martin Sanbu, who uh, we discussed the same issue on our podcast last summer. And so maybe you could sort of outline your your argument and maybe outline the sort of state of play when it comes to frozen Russian assets. What are they? Where are they? And why is this so complicated and difficult? Okay, thank you uh, so much for having me, uh, Max, and uh, it's really an honor to be here with you all. I should emphasize that, a bit like Martin Sandbu, um, that's a snark, I'm not a lawyer. So uh, I think all of us here are non-lawyers are learning about a number of complicated concepts of international law, on which I will probably not use exactly the right words. Uh, so I hope to learn more and improve my practice in future. So what are we talking about? Uh, The Central Bank of Russia, like many central banks, used to hold assets abroad. They are are called foreign reserves. They are held abroad because they are in foreign currency. And when you have very large uh, amounts of foreign currency, which is what we're talking about uh, here, it's basically impractical to hold them at home, especially if you're a central bank. Basically, you have to hold dollars in the US, uh, euros in the eurozone, yen in Japan, and so on and so forth. Uh, Then, of course, you can have gold. The Central Bank of Russia has that. You can have a little bit of foreign currency onshore in Russia or offshore, but in third-party jurisdictions, for example, dollars in Dubai or things like that. But uh, it's not that easy. So essentially, that's what the Central Bank of Russia had before the invasion, And what it did before the invasion is that it expected sanctions from the U.S., also from the U.K., Canada, Australia, uh, maybe Japan. And what they did is they withdrew their money from those jurisdictions. They converted them into mainly euros and euro-denominated assets. Uh, That's why when the decision was made unanimously by uh, the coalition of Ukraine's friends uh, very quickly on February 26, two days after the invasion, in 2022, uh, Russia apparently fully expected to have that decision imposed on them in the US, UK, and elsewhere, but not in the Eurozone. And the consequence of that is that the bulk of the assets are in the Eurozone, at least those assets in those jurisdictions. Um, uh, There is about orders of magnitude, $300 billion, which is about 270 billion euros of immobilized assets. So the stuff we're talking about within those coalition countries. And of this, uh, at least 200 billion, but probably more like 240 or 50, is in the Eurozone. Uh, There is no certainty about the uh, exact numbers. And of that, again, at least 180 billion, so the bulk, not just of the Eurozone stash, but of the entire immobilized stash, are in one uh, financial institution, which is not well known to the general public. It's called Euroclear. It's what is called in the jargon a central securities depository. And this is where you hold, you get your securities held. So Russia had probably not that many equities, but probably a lot of fixed income securities, bonds, primarily probably government bonds. And uh, those government bonds were held at Euroclear. So that's what makes Euroclear the centerpiece of this conversation 
it holds the vast majority of euro-denominated immobilized assets of the Bank of Russia, which in turn is the vast majority of all immobilized assets because Russia had withdrawn from the other uh, jurisdictions. So maybe we could walk through some of the, the timeline here because I think it was pretty dramatic. You know, R- Russia obviously invades Ukraine and at least according to the Financial Times, uh, if I remember correctly, you know, there was a sort of now famous conversation between then Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi with uh, Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary. And of course, Mario Draghi was the former uh, head of the European Central Bank where you know, they sort of come up with the idea, and I think it was probably Draghi's idea, to freeze uh, central bank assets. And I think prior to the war, when the U.S. and Europe were doing a lot of sanctions planning, I had never heard anyone sort of mention freezing uh, the central bank assets, because I think it was seen as sort of too significant a step. Uh, But it happened, as you mentioned, very quickly. So is that the actions that they then took, you know, so that money has just been or since since the that money has been frozen right in the early days of the invasion it's just been sitting there right in euro clear accounts and what what what's been happening with the the funds have they been is it been making uh, money has it been accruing interest maybe you could talk a little bit about that that's right and i think you're very right to emphasize the importance of that moment on uh, february 26 when there was this famous phone call uh, Draghi convincing Yellen that this was the right thing to do. So there are, it's quite subtle, actually. There are many different ways to analyze it in terms of the transatlantic relationship. I think it's fair to say that the technical preparation of the sanctions package was almost entirely done by the U.S. So the uh, executive office of the president of the U.S., the White House, particularly one uh, official there, uh, Dalip Singh, and a number of colleagues, they had worked for months before the invasion of Ukraine, when they started to understand that Russia may invade Ukraine and that the intelligence, as you remember, was pointing in that direction, they prepared for it. But at the moment of decision, it was really a joint decision by the Europeans, at the end of the day unanimously, and the Americans, and there was back and forth between Europe and the U.S. So I don't want to say, you know, it was primarily a European or primarily a U.S. decision. I think the preparation was unquestionably American, so there was leadership of the U.S. there. But for me, as an observer of the transatlantic relationship, um, this was a really important and fascinating moment. So now, fast forward to the current moment. At the moment of the decision, um, again, I may be wrong by a few billion, but you know, a billion here, a billion there. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's not full transparency in that space. But on uh, late February 22, when the assets are immobilized, there's about 180 billion at your clear. I insist, by the way, that there is nearly 100 billion euro, uh, which is not an, uh, a small amount of money outside of Euroclear. At this point, everybody talks about Euroclear. We don't talk about the rest. Well, in large part because we don't know where it is. We, we have much more detail about Euroclear than about the rest. Uh, and this is just because for Euroclear, this thing was just too big to hide. The Euroclear was not probably, I mean, I'm making my own inference here, but I could imagine that Euroclear was not particularly happy to disclose the fact that they had so many Russian assets and uh, so much exposure there. But it was just so big for them uh, that they couldn't hide it. So here's the mechanism. When uh, a central bank holds securities at Euroclear, you and I don't know from Euroclear's disclosure how much that central bank holds. But when those securities come to maturity, and sorry, I will go a little bit into the financial technicalities, but it's important to understand here. When those securities come to maturity or they pay coupons, so you get cash, right? So central bank of Russia gets cash. And the cash is treated very differently from the securities in terms of accounting, booking, and um, also from a financial perspective. So for to handle that cash, Euroclear has a banking license. Euroclear is not a bank in terms of its business model, but it does have a banking license. And actually, that cash ends up in an entity called Euroclear Bank. And the balance sheet of Euroclear Bank normally hovers around 30 billion euros, a little bit more, a little bit less, generally a little bit less. Because, and normally what happens is that when you're an account holder at Euroclear, you get cash on your account at Euroclear Bank, the incentives that are set for you are to take that cash away as soon as possible. So either you reinvest it into securities held at Euroclear, 
or you take it away, you put it in a proper bank, and you invest it somewhere else, or you leave it in that bank. But the point here is that your class conditions, and this is really important for what we're talking about, make it explicit that this cash is not remunerated when it st sits at your clear, and that basically everything is made to make it unattractive to leave the cash at your clear. And indeed, for a normal account holder, uh, the cash is not even left there overnight. So what typically happens for everybody else is that when they get cash on their Euroclear account, in the same day, they take it away either through reinvestment or through transfer to another institution. Now, that's important. What happened with Central Bank of Russia, Central Bank of the Russian Federation, it's all synonymous. What happened to the Bank of Russia is that they couldn't move the cash away or reinvest it because of the sanctions. And because of that, their cash has been trapped at Euroclear Bank and has accumulated and accumulated and accumulated to the extent that now of the about 180 billion initially in securities at Euroclear with zero in cash, now there's more than 130 billion in cash and the rest in securities. And that cash appears on the balance sheet of Euroclear Bank, therefore Euroclear Bank has to disclose it. So if you add it with their normal business of 30 billion, the balance sheet of Euroclear Bank has ballooned, sorry to use the wrong metaphor given what happened last year, uh, from 30 billion euros before the sanctions started to 165 billion euros, again, give or take a billion uh, or two currently. So basically they couldn't hide it because it just transformed the size of their balance sheet too much. That's why we know so much. Now, that cash generates income for Euroclear because Euroclear as a bank has no reason not to put that cash to work in a conservative way, prudently. So they typically put it to work, I guess, in you know, central bank reserves that gives them the central bank policy rate. Um, but we've gone out of the uh, low inflation or no inflation era in Europe as in the US, and therefore you make a, you know, a few percentage points on your cash at the central bank, and that means that uh, Euroclear has been making about $4 billion, uh, in uh, profits after tax on the Russian cash last year, and it's probably going to do, make more this year. And that cash, as I said, is explicitly not belonging to the Bank of Russia because the conditions of your clear are that you're not entitled to deposit remuneration for cash held at your clear bank. So that's why there is this idea that the interest income made by your clear on the accumulated Russian cash could be used for Ukraine without infringing on the general stance of the European Union, which is that they're not confiscating Russian property at your clear because of the legal concerns. Right. And I, we've actually just had news in the last few hours. There was the uh, Weimar Triangle meeting between uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz of Germany, the, the, the French President Emmanuel Macron, and the Polish Prime Minister. And in the announcement, German Chancellor Scholz uh, indicated that uh, he was willing to sort of go ahead and and seize essentially the the profits that Euroclear was making from uh, the Russian central bank holdings, and then use that for arms for Ukraine, either providing that to Ukraine directly, or uh, it's not quite clear to me if they're going to use the money for Europe to then buy on Ukraine's behalf. But so essentially, I think they're taking you up on your, your recommendation. Well, it's not my recommendation. It's something that the European Commission has started to work on uh, as early, I think, as the spring of 22. So a few weeks after the invasion, they've started to think about this model at your clear and how much of that money could be uh, appropriated for Ukraine in a way that would not infringe on uh, principles of international law. We can talk about the international law stuff later, but the view generally held in Europe, um, not necessarily everywhere in the US, but pretty generally in Europe, is that outright confiscation of the uh, assets of the central bank in the Eurozone, including all those securities that you're clear and the cash pile, uh, would be in breach of uh, the European Union's international commitments. But because the income made by Euroclear on the cash pile doesn't belong to the Bank of Russia for the very specific business model linked uh, reasons that I uh, tried to explain before, then that income is fair game, it belongs to Euroclear. Now, of course, you will ask, wait a minute, can the EU confiscate legitimate income of Euroclear uh, as if it was, uh, you know, uh, no property rights? The answer is nuanced. 
it is a radical thing for the EU to do. I don't think there is any precedent. It does generate a lot of debate, a bit behind the scenes, because all this is so sensitive. But if only in Belgium, which is the country where Euroclear uh, is located, you know, I think there are many different opinions about the EU coming and confiscating profits of a local company. Now, the Belgian government has also acknowledged that they viewed those profits as kind of special. Uh, they are windfall profits. They wouldn't be there if uh, the sanctions hadn't been there. Euroclear itself, actually, is becoming a bit of a political football. So they have said that, yeah, they view it as their property, but they also understand <laughs> that people view it as a windfall profit. So, so you know, they cannot, you know, they have duties to their shareholders. If they're making profits, in principle, the shareholders should get those profits. So it's a very difficult situation for Euroclear. Uh, they cannot just say, okay, we're giving this money to Ukraine because Ukraine is fighting the good fight. They cannot do that from a legal perspective. They would get sued by shareholders. So it's a bit intricate, but, uh, but I, the Belgian government, as I said, uh, has decided that the normal income tax, corporate income tax that they have made on those windfall profits would be transferred by the Belgian government to Ukraine. And uh, so that's the first step. And then the next step is to say the entire windfall profits after the Belgian normal corporate income tax would be appropriated. I think the European Union wants to call it a contribution, which is a bit euphemistic. And uh, that would not be taxation in a strict sense, because that word carries a special meaning in EU law and it would require a different procedure. But basically, the EU would uh, appropriate that income. Uh, Euroclear would not fight very violently against that and would give it to Ukraine. For that, you need a legislative act of the EU, which is basically of the same nature as any of the sanctions that the EU has been taking on the basis of the same treaty article, Article 215 of the treaty, if I remember correctly. But it would not be technically a sanction. It would be uh, an action to help Ukraine. I, I guess another way would also be for if the Belgian government decided that they were going to pass legislation that would just tax windfall profits made from profits uh, seized from uh, from that were accrued because of Russia sanctions and then just took that money and voluntarily hand that over to Ukraine. But let me let me ask you if um, just let me let me interrupt you on yeah, that yeah. one. Why is Belgium not doing that? Yeah. Well, why not? I think I think quite simply that would be putting a giant target sign on uh, their uh, piece of the map. I think given the aggressiveness of Russia, both in terms of propaganda and all kinds of other actions, I think it's entirely understandable that Belgium uh, might have a preference uh, for the EU taking that confiscatory action of the windfall income to the benefit of Ukraine, as opposed to Belgium as, you know, the country where the company is located, uh, with uh, fiscal uh, sovereignty and taxation sovereignty, uh, just because of the risks associated with that. So basically, the indication is that Belgium views the EU as more able to shoulder the risk and mutualize it uh, than if it was a uni unilateral national action. But that's just an assumption from my yeah. side, because indeed, from a legal perspective, it would be much simpler if it was done at the national level uh, by Belgium. Now, maybe let's turn to the, the bigger question here, uh, which we've sort of, you know, we, we were talking about the, the windfall profits. And, and, and I think there's a, a now a clear road ahead for the EU to take uh, or to access that funding. And, and your estimate is it's, it's less than 10 billion uh, over the last two years. And that's significant funding for Ukraine. It would be very useful. But the basic dilemma here right now, the way I see it, is that there's a massive funding problem for Ukraine and that, you know, wars are insane to begin because uh, they're so incredibly expensive and you basically find yourself just spending a ton of money to build weapons and, and munitions that you then quickly use and destroy, right? It's the, you know, epitome, if you're an economist, it's literally just, you know, digging the hole and, and then, you know, shoveling and putting dirt back into the hole. But in this case... The EU seems like it's really struggling to figure out how it's going to provide funding for Ukraine. The U.S. currently is stuck in providing assistance to Ukraine. Hopefully the $60 billion in military aid for Ukraine will, will break through from Congress uh, sometime soon, but it may not. And while the EU passed more than $50 billion for Ukraine economically, it's very much struggling to allocate the funding to ramp up defense industrial production. So considering that you 
you know, the, that if the U.S. sort of steps away here, the EU would need to find funding, either a member state level or collectively. Uh, and there's this strong reticence to to borrow funding at the EU level. You have this, you know, as you mentioned, more than, you know, close to 200 billion euros sitting there in an EU bank that is Russian assets. So why not just try to seize all of that and sort of solve the problem of financial support and military support for Ukraine? Yeah, why not just take the money? And um, I think there's a bit of an asymmetry of perceptions here, if I may say so without hurting any sensitivities. But um, in the EU, as you mentioned, uh, the EU just passed a 50 billion package of financial assistance to Ukraine. Uh, So that's exactly the same amount, and that's probably not a coincidence as the what was asked from Congress by the Biden administration. $60 billion, $50 billion, euro, it's about the same. It's not exactly, you know, apples to apples. Uh, but there was an understanding from the beginning of the war that the burden of, the financial burden of assistance to Ukraine would be shared about equally by the EU and the US. And that was, I don't know that this understanding was ever articulated publicly. So that's my inference from previous events. Now, we also have to keep in mind that this is not a huge amount of money if you compare it with resources of the U.S. and the EU. And especially for the EU, you know, the EU has a GDP of about 16 trillion. I never remember if it's dollars or euro, but 16 trillion. So what is being committed through the Ukraine facility, which in theory, probably not in practice, is over four years, so uh, 15 billion a year, uh, dollar in dollar terms, uh, that's about one thousandth of EU GDP. It's not much. I mean, there are many fiscal discussions that are about more than a thousandth of GDP, uh, whether at the country level in the EU, in the US, or in the EU as a whole. And therefore, an expansion of that effort is something that the EU can absolutely consider, if necessary, if it believes, which it does, that helping Ukraine defend itself is good value for money. I mean, Mr. Orban may not believe that, but that's been the consistent stance of the EU so far. So why are we having this discussion? I would like to flip your argument. There are good reasons not to move from immobilization to confiscation of the Russian assets. If there's a cost to that in terms of credibility, in terms of the moral high ground of you know, Ukraine's friends, uh, we'll come to that then why not continue giving Ukraine what it needs through the uh, same channels as as we've had so far? And at this point, this machinery uh, is not working as intended, but it's not working as intended, I'm sorry to say, in the US, not in the EU. Uh, The EU had a two, three months delay to the uh, decision on its Ukraine facility, but that's over. And now it's up and running and there is a lot of money committed. So this asymmetry between US and EU situations and perceptions, I think it's essential to have it in mind to understand the debate about uh, the reserve assets. And indeed, that's correlation, not causation. But the moment when the US government started explicitly backing the idea of confiscation of Russian assets is exactly the moment when the situation became deadlocked in Congress. And I, I, I find it difficult to yeah. assume that this is a pure timing coincidence, even so that's, I think, what U.S. officials are saying about it. No, I think, I, let, me, let me just say, I think that's very clear, that there's, there's a, re- a recognition that there's a, co- a potential cost in credibility and how the U.S. or EU would be viewed as, as uh, you know, if they seize sovereign assets. On the other hand, I mean, the basic, I guess the, the point I would challenge you on is that the basic challenge here is that Ukraine is running out of guns and ammunition, just crucial things. And if the United States cannot provide that because it doesn't have funding, then someone has to fund it. And so... That's right. But that raises a very interesting question. Why isn't the EU just saying, look, we have committed a bunch of money for Ukraine. We can mobilize resources from member states. Let's buy those shells from the US and call it a day. Uh, The reason is not financial. It's strategic. It's, it's because of the imbalance it would bring in the transatlantic relationship. Maybe we'll come to this. I don't think it can be ruled out. But the reason it hasn't happened yet is not out of financial scarcity in Europe. Not at all. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is where I might disagree a bit. I think when it comes to production, 
the Europeans actually have as much production capacity, especially when it comes to certain shells, as the United States. But what they're not doing is putting the contracts in with their own producers, because you have the classic collective action problem with European member states not wanting to sort of all join forces with ministries of defense, not wanting to allocate 10 years worth of funding for 10 year long term contracts. But this so it's sort of I think I think it's a combination. I think it's a, that one def- depends a little bit on your time horizon. I think you're right if you take a medium term time horizon. But for the immediate, you know, this month, this week, uh, Ukraine needs shells. My understanding, and you probably know more, much more than I do about that, but my understanding until now is that the U.S. could deliver those shells next week if they have congressional authorization. It's not clear to me that the EU can deliver them next week. No, no, that's right. But what the EU has not done is actually ramp up the production. Shame on, shame on them for not having done that. I agree. Yeah. And so, but I guess the, the, the issue for me is that there's just has to be a lot of money poured into, unfortunately, defense companies who demand obscene amounts of money to provide obscene amounts of arms. And that's sort of where we are in the current state of this conflict. And Right now, the Europeans aren't doing that. The Americans aren't doing that. And it seems to me that Europe could just simply fund this through a national level. And Germany, in some ways, is stepping up and providing a lot of funding. But at the EU level, or I guess many other countries, I would say, aren't really doing that. And so we're not having the kind of the uh, your point about the broader you know 16 trillion is totally true and it's like there but it's not happening and so this would so be an me, easy way for it to happen I let guess. me rephrase it uh i agree with you on substance but i think there had been a deal of a division of labor between the eu and the us for a variety of political and legal reasons and the deal was we're giving about the same amount of money The U.S. is focusing on the military aid. The EU is focusing on the non-military aid, what they call microfinancial assistance or what have you, which is basically making sure the U.S., the Ukrainian government can pay the bills at the end of the month, because that's what it is about. And therefore, that they don't have to run into monetary financing, which would call, of course, hyperinflation and uh, society, uh, I mean, fractures in society, to say the least. So we had that division of labor. It held broadly until the end of last year. And then we discovered one thing, which was that, you know, the U.S. is no longer able to deliver its part of that deal because of congressional deadlock. I think we all agree here that either the congressional deadlock is lifted and can be considered lifted for also looking forward, or the deal has to be changed. It's just that there is inertia in the changing of the deal. And, uh, and, And I think that's exactly the period we're in. I'm pretty sure that a year from now, we will have a different arrangement in terms of the division of labor. The critical point from my non-military perspective, looking at the military front, is that the inertia associated with that pivot should not result, as it does right now, in scarcity of uh, ammunition on the Ukraine uh, battlefield. And that's the tragedy of the current moment, is that because there, there is this pivot, which probably has to happen anyway, I don't want to you know, pass judgment on Congress, but it was unexpected, it was not planned for, It takes time to uh, execute it, and the tragedy is that uh, that results in uh, ammunition scarcity for the Ukraine military, which really shouldn't happen. So looking forward, what do you think should then happen to Russian assets? Because, you know, they're being frozen. They're sitting there accruing funding. I mean, on the one hand, they sit there and keep uh, accruing, you know, 4 billion, 5 billion euro a year for for Ukraine. That's, That's quite positive. But where does this go? You know, uh, there's demand for reparations, I think, uh, perhaps at the end of the war. Uh, Would this just be seized for that? Or would this just be sit there indefinitely and then given back to Russia? Uh, I mean, I think there's sort of a moral argument to make that that this money should never go back to Russia. So I'm curious. Yeah, I have have sympathy for that argument. I mean, uh, with some qualifications. But basically, you know, you tell me how and when the war ends, and then I will tell you the scenarios. So you go first. (laughs) <laughs> Nobody, no, none of us knows how the, the war will end and when. I think the current uh, like baseline assumption for many is that it just sort of is a stalemate that is sort of a, a conflict that never ends, but is basically frozen in time. And so that would also mean that, that these assets are frozen in time as well. Maybe. Who knows? I mean, I, I've been recently looking at what people and, you know, the consensus 
were saying in March 22, so a few days and weeks after the full-scale invasion. I can tell you one thing, the consensus was wrong. People at the, at the time didn't envisage uh, what we, has happened since then. And I say with maybe arrogance, but a very uh, strong degree of confidence that two years from now, the landscape will look different from what the consensus is now. Yeah. So I think we have to be very humble. Wars are unpredictable. They go in uh, unexpected directions. And really the discussion about what should be done after the war ends or after the war has stabilized enough that there is n no longer any fighting are maybe interesting as intellectual exercises. They have absolutely no impact on policy at this point. This is not the way decisions are made. And I think that's actually quite normal. Uh, so yeah. at this point, uh, the policy decisions are about fighting and maybe winning the war. Uh, and I'm certainly among those who want wi Ukraine to win and Russia to lose, uh, because I think it's essential for Europe and for the world. But uh, the post-war settlement is just subject to too many uncertainties to be discussed with any relevance at this point. So the real question is essentially two questions. How many resources does Russia have to fight the war? How many resources does Ukraine have to fight the war? On the first question, and this is very important, how many resources does Russia have to fight the war? The question of immobilization versus confiscation has no impact on the answer to that question. For Russia, under the current circumstances and for the foreseeable future, and actually the G7 has said explicitly, as long as we haven't reached a peace settlement, they don't have access to that money. So immobilization works very well. So the uh, distinction between immobilization and confiscation is very important in terms of, you know, the, uh, not only symbolism, but the precedent it means and its impact on the global monetary system, and maybe we'll come to that, and yeah. the international rule of law. So it has zero impact on resources for Russia. Zero. Absolutely none. So then the question is, does that decision have impact in terms of resources for Ukraine? And this is what I was coming at before. If we're able to give Ukraine what it needs without having to touch those assets, then that's probably the best course of action. And the answer for the EU is yes, we are able to do that. It's pretty clear now that we've passed the latest urban uh, shenanigans. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. It never is. But I think the EU has demonstrated its ability and willingness to mobilize funding without having to confiscate Russian assets in order to help Ukraine. Will it have to increase that funding to offset the parts that the U.S. is not providing? Maybe in the future. I wouldn't rule that out. I think my reading of the EU preferences is that they prefer to ramp up the current channels of funding as opposed to destroying their international legal credibility. Uh, by confiscating assets. So I think that's the crux of the discussion at this point. And, and maybe just sort of one final question here. I mean, I think for many of the advocates of seizing Russian central bank assets that you they look at it and say, well, the, the upside is quite clear, right? You, you then have this war chest, literal war chest for Ukraine to fight this war. But the downside risks, and maybe you could articulate them uh, to, to close us out, um, what do you see the downside risks? You've alluded to them of the international reputation, but as an economist, you know, is, is this sort of a theoretical risk? Is this sort of a, you know, it, you know, sort of vaguely impacting the international legal order? Or is there are there things that are a bit more tangible that advocates of confiscation may be missing? So economists are not unanimous about this question or about any question for that matter. Um, <laughs> you know the famous joke, you ask a question to two economists, you get three answers. Uh, this one uh, is no exception. So I don't think I speak for an international economic consensus uh, by uh, giving my opinion. But my opinion is very widely shared in the central banking community. And uh, or at least that's been my perception so far. The Federal Reserve has been very silent on that issue. I'm not aware that they have ever said anything about Russian reserve assets. The former governor of the Federal Reserve, a certain Janet Yellen, uh, is now Treasury Secretary. In the early months of the war, she was saying confiscation would be illegal, and she was saying it in no uncertain terms. Uh, she's been quoted repeatedly by the media. Now the U.S. government says her words have been misunderstood, taken out of context, and now Mrs. Yellen says, yes, there's a good case for confiscating the assets. So here, here we are about uh, the central banking views uh, in the U.S. and outside of the U.S., 
so ECB has been a bit more vocal about the fact that this might be dangerous, but even they have not really put their head above the parapet. And other central bankers have been very discreet. But I think it is, from my perspective, pretty clear that this idea doesn't raise a lot of enthusiasm uh, in the community of current central bankers. Among former central bankers, you know, it's always a bit different. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so, uh, so we're observing that. Now, why is it so important for central banks? Because the international monetary system is largely based on trust among central banks. So you have something, for example, like the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, very important institution. Nobody hears about it. Uh, it is important. It's based on trust. Russia no longer participates in the Bank for International Settlements since the invasion. It is not clear exactly whether they have been kicked out or whether they just decided that, you know, it was not in their interest to continue participating. But this is just to, uh, you know, approach this point, which is very intangible in many ways, but very important, that there is basically more trust among central banks. Whether we like it or not, there is a good case for criticizing that situation. But there is more trust among central banks in the world, including with Russia, China, and what have you, than there is between governments and than there is between people. And that underpins the monetary and financial system in which we live in, which is a long-winded way of saying if we change that, and moving from immobilization to confiscation would change that, in my view, then we have consequences that we cannot exactly map because it has never happened. I mean, I can go with you into all the precedents going back to, you know, World War II or the Franco-Prussian War or what have you. But basically, it has never happened. There is no precedent for that action, including in wartime, in very horrendous, atrocious wars that were completely existential. Uh, and um, so we'll discover what happens if we do it. But, you know, that's like detonating a number of explosives, maybe, you know, not to be tried at home, uh, and uh, maybe better not to try. Well, Nicola, I think this has been a really fascinating and interesting conversation. I think, I think I sort of hear you loud and clear that there are other options for supporting Ukraine. And if perhaps if this was the only option uh, there to provide Ukraine, it would shift the calculus a little bit. It would, it would. Let me insist on that. The primary imperative is to give Ukraine what it needs for its defense. This is what we have to do no matter what. If confiscation was the only way to do that, then I believe I would be in favor of confiscation. We're not in that situation. And as long as we're not in that situation, I think we have to, you know, see the trade-offs. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Nicola, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to having you back on the show down the road. Of course, thank you as well to all our loyal listeners. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our podcast. And of course, give us a five-star review, whether you like our podcast or not. Just give us a five-star review. Additionally, if you haven't already, be sure to check out our sister podcast, The Eurofile, wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Russian Roulette. We hope you enjoyed this episode and tune in again soon. Russian Roulette releases new episodes every two weeks on Thursdays and is available wherever you get your podcasts. So please subscribe and share our episodes online. And be sure to check out all the latest analysis by the Europe, Russia and Eurasia program at csis.org. Mm-hmm.